probably have people coming in after three. That's pretty typical for Pines Village activities. <laughs> well, we're all old. Exactly. <laughs> Some of us had another activity right before this. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, welcome to the third installment of the Golden Age of the Oval. Um, yes. <laughs> Essentially, the golden age for any who haven't been here before is the, uh, in my view, is the 18th century. Particularly in the first half, you had a number of uh, composers coming of age at the beginning of the 18th century. Five of them within, were born within eight years of each other, the ones I've been doing in this series. Um, and you didn't yet have other, some other instruments like the clarinet or the piano. And so, composers uh, composed for what was available. And you had things, obviously strings, but you had uh, uh, flutes among the winds. You didn't have the clarinet yet. The piano wasn't yet ready for use at the beginning of that century, so they weren't writing music for the piano. Uh, they really weren't writing modern symphony form until the middle of the century which means they wrote a lot of good old music. And so the first installment, I worked on uh, uh, Vivaldi. He was the earliest of them, and Telemann, and last time, Handel. Uh, and to, today it will be Bach and Marcello, I hope, and next time, Haydn and uh, Cimarosa. Anyway. The first five of these guys were all born within eight years of each other, and all, well, the oldest of Vivaldi was 21 at the turn of the 18th century, and the youngest of them, Marcello, was 13. So they were all grouped together, Handel and Bach were born the same year. Um, so that's kind of the background. Now I want to talk a little bit about, more about the oboe. Today it'll be a little different. I talked about the reed last time, and I've got an old one here, which I'm going to pass around. You have the cane at the top. You have a metal tube with cork around it at the bottom. That's what goes in the oval. And holding all this together uh, is some kind of uh, material. Sometimes my first oval teacher. Uh, his wife would get silk ready for him and dye it red, so all of his reeds had to be red. Um, middle. Anyway, you can see what it looks like. Uh, that's a reed which I am going to give to my granddaughter to practice cutting on if we don't mess it up to make it bad. Now, this was a big week for the foster, I'm sorry, big week and a half for the foster family because a week ago, Last Monday, we acquired something which we're now calling the Foster Family Oval. This is the oval I've been playing before. It's made out of, I think, resin, some kind of composite. Uh, it's fairly light, actually. Uh, and it is known as a student oval which means it has less keys, actually has less holes in it, uh, and it's what I would use in the first two programs. And I'll play a little bit on it so you can see, get a comparison. Uh, when Jeannie Foster first heard the two, says, wow, what a difference. And uh, my teacher, Larry Evans, is in the audience, and he concurs on um, anyway, last Monday, uh, Julia, our, our son, Charlie, drove us to a place called Ovo Chicago. And uh, Julian, the purpose was that Julia and I could spend several hours playing oboes. And we were interested in a, a good wood oval. Uh, I would never at age 93 think about buying such a good oval for myself. 
It's crazy. But uh, the idea was if we pick one that really fits Julia, it will this will be Julia's inheritance. She won't have to wait for me to die. Uh, I will probably quit playing long before that. Oh, you never know. And um, within a couple of years, she may be going off to college, majoring in music, and that would be a good, who knows. Um, and, but anyway, the idea was for it to fit Julia. Well, we had six oboes. A couple of them are what they're called the Ray AK model, and the other four, I think, were Royal. Um, so we each played all of these oboes, and the two of us actually reached agreement rather quickly that there were two of them that we each liked the best, and they were the same two. And so then we did a lot more playing, and I could have pretty much gone 50-50. Uh, the other one, not the one we ended up getting, uh, was only about three years old and had been played by one owner, namely the oboe and English horn player of the Lyric Opera. <laughs> nice oboe. Actually, it was more expensive than this one. But for Julia, it wasn't a 50-50 matter. This is the oboe that really fit. And I'm kind of hoping in November uh, the time when Pines Village has us scheduled is the day before Thanksgiving, which happens to be a school holiday. And the pieces I'd already picked out for that, uh, one was by Haydn. Guess what? She's playing part of that this year for us, you know, in the state contest. So I'm hoping that we can entice her to come and for her to play part of that program, because she's good at it. The other uh, composer will be uh, Chimarosa, and guess what? She played two movements of that concerto last year in the state contest and got gold. So uh, that's kind of what I'm hoping for, uh, be four weeks from today. But anyway, this oboe fits her to a T, and uh, maybe you'll get to hear her on it. Um, it's funny, the oboe kind of picks you. <laughs> you know, you think you've got four oboes, six oboes, all lined, they were all lined up in stands on a piano. Uh, <laughs> uh, same manufacturer, but each one feels different. Okay. get to some music. We're going to play Bach first. Mm -hmm. This is a concerto for violin and oboe. Uh, my teacher Larry Allen has played the oboe part uh, with, uh, with Betty Gehring, who wanted to do this at her retirement recital. And um, I actually requested this music because I heard it on so our channel 749, which is one of the 50 or so music channels we have. And I was in the next room and I heard it, liked it, wanted to look to see what it was, and, and uh, here we are. Uh, this and the, well, the Marcello number we're going to do uh, all have this familiar pattern. There are there each three movements. Maybe you can guess a little from the past two months how the tempos are going to go. We start Allegro, Adagio, Allegro. Anybody remember some words they could put with it? Slow and fast. Slow? Turn it on its head. Slow. <laughs> fast, slow, fast. Yeah. And, um, well, if they're not vivace, that we, I think both of the last two months we had a movement that was vivace, which is, uh, carries that particular distinction. Okay. Um, before
before we actually start, I am going to uh, I'm going to play something that really isn't part of the performance uh, because we're not going to start at the beginning of the first movement. Wow. Uh, we'll start into the movement and give you a taste of it. But I'll play a couple bars from the first, from the very beginning, just to show you what it sounds like. Remember, this is the resin composite vocal.
Then we have Allegro again. century in his last post in uh, Leipzig. Um, he was the uh, uh, Thomas Cantor. Interestingly, his last post, uh, he was second choice. It had been offered to Telemann, whom we heard about the first month here, and Telemann turned it down, so they turned to Bach, and of course he became famous <laughs> in, the, in that post in uh, Leipzig, but he just did so much in uh, so many areas of music. I mean, it's impossible and probably well known to many of you. On the other hand, uh, Benedetto Marcello, I had never heard of until uh, Larry Allen gave me this piece of music. But then on our uh, ch uh, channel in um, Pines Village with uh, television, uh, the music choice channels, which are in the 700s, I frequently have at 749. And I must say, since I started paying attention to this, I have heard this particular concerto by Marcello more than any other piece of classical music in the last six months. You hear it over and over again. And interestingly, it isn't always played by on an oboe. I heard it yesterday. It's played by John Williams, a British guitar player. And I've heard him on there before. I've heard a trumpet player. You know, you're in the next room and you hear this melody and it says, gosh, that sounds familiar. And you go in and look at what it is and it's uh, Marcello's Concerto for Oboe. So, Although he wrote a lot of stuff, just like these other Baroque composers, and then, you know, in a lot of different fields, and we won't go into all that, it seems to me here in Valparaiso, this particular piece of music is the one I keep hearing on the um, Music Choice channels. Okay, uh, without saying too much more about it, I think it's time to play. Remember, Allegro, faster than 
montage you go. I like it. And the trick here is It's Allegro, actually it's Allegro Matarato, but the big thing I have to worry about is uh, Gene will play an introduction and uh, we just don't want to go in too fast, so we'll see. <laughs> this will be especially true on the second movement. A lot of Each measure of the introduction <laughs> when we're practicing starts going faster and faster. Yeah. See, it looks like that. That's very, that's a lot of ink. So, um, yeah. Anyway, if you're set. No, but I'm going to play anyway. Okay. Here we go. Like that, okay? That's fine. <laughs>
three. of it for insurance purposes is $6,800. Mm -hmm. mm. That's why I wouldn't just buy this for myself no, at age don't. 93. <laughs> Dick? How much is each one individually made? In other words, the resin one I would think would be mostly mass produced. I would assume they have molds <laughs> Or something into it to but, produce but the, the joint, the upper and lower joint. So I could imagine the wooden one being made on wood that is different a little bit throughout. And, uh, well, that the fact that it's made with a wood I never heard of before called granadella uh, <laughs> uh, means it must be good. But, but you know, in my own mind, I've been thinking about this. And I'm, you know, uh, we mentioned last time that an oboe is basically a cone, very tiny at the top where the reed goes in. Down uh, before you get to the bell, I can, I can at least put my finger in it, which is a lot bigger than an oboe reed. So I'm trying to figure out what kind of equipment would you need to drill out and get such a nice smooth bore that would taper down slightly. Well, I mean, uh, to me, that would account for variations mm -hmm. that are important. Well, the wood itself will have variations. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, is, it, it just amazed me. I mean, people, uh, probably Larry Allen has talked about different ovals will fill. You will fill. You know. yes. And it's true. Everyone <laughs> fills different. That we tried that day. And they were all good ovals. Is there a... Is there an issue about in how big a group you play, 
that if you're in a symphony, you want a different kind of oboe than you want with chamber music? I don't know the answer to that. I think sometimes, you know, cellos and all that, there is a little issue. Yeah, well, your daughter was a yeah. cello player, so. Um, I know there are, you know, you can have issues that uh, in the higher registers, oh, one yeah. album may play better than another. You also have that issue with reeds. Um, but I really don't know. Does it get better as you, sometimes they say string instruments need to be used. Well, I think that's true here too. Is that true? Actually, one, one of the things I learned up at Ovo Chicago is if you buy a new one, now that's more expensive, <laughs> but it, it's a process that takes months to break it in. Uh, it's kind of like we used to have to break in a car. You know, you, you play it 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes later in the day, and you do that for a week, and then you up it to 20 minutes. <laughs> no. I mean, and this goes on for months. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that was news to me that they actually, I mean, we used to have to break in cars kind of like that. <laughs> now we don't have to do that so much. So I take it that the wooden oboe is heavier than yes. the composite? Yes. Interestingly enough, if you look at the um, thumb rest for the right thumb, there's a little ring above it. That means uh, I might be able to live with this oboe longer. Oh, another thing new today, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, maybe you noticed I wore a glove in the first two presentations. Well, a little over two weeks ago, I had a cortisone shot. And by the same afternoon, I found I could play the oboe without the compression glove I normally wear. And I, I wear the glove at night, but, uh, you know, I had a two-hour band practice last night, no glove. I'll have an hour and 45-minute one tonight, no glove, I hope. I, I carry the glove. I even brought it here in case I needed it today. But, and then this carpal tunnel has been a problem with this arm, but it eventually will happen here, too. And that little loop on there means I could actually, if I had trouble supporting the, the oboe, I could play with a lanyard. You do this with the next instrument down in the double reed family. It's the English horn. Well, not the only instrument, but commonly used in orchestras. English horn. And uh, that is, I think, almost always played with a lanyard because it's even heavier yet. Uh, you know, it's bigger and it's made out of would so um, that would really be hard on your right arm and thumb and all that. Yes, definitely heavier. Uh, when I picked up this thing, I almost felt like twirling it mm -hmm. <laughs> because it felt so light after I've been playing the other for a few days. Okay. Did you have to break that wood one in? No, because it's already used. It's about a 12-year-old oval. Thanks, Jeannie. You're welcome. It was fun. Good luck. It was. <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. Well, I mean, you know, it's interesting playing on a new instrument. As I said, there. I'm still getting used to some of the different feel to the... Uh, fingers, but uh, it, it was fun to play, actually. And uh, the nice thing is, with this company, I don't worry about when I'm missing notes and what I mean, just carry on. Who knows? Well, I do. Larry does. <laughs> uh, you mentioned on the professional level that there's more stops, more keys. Yeah, uh, the, the, uh, the student oboe uh, goes to the, the half step below the middle C on the piano.
so and the profession. Memorize. Well, I mean, you have to memorize them. Well, well the, the real problem is I've got 80 years that, of finger memory. And one of the key, it fascinates me, one of the keys that has been added here is this one. And it allows uh, the, 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 the note F has uh, always been a problem with the oboe because the best fingering you have for it, within, well, on your left hand, all three middle fingers are holding down things. But on the right hand, uh, you use the index finger for a special key. The problem is, if with certain notes precede or follow the F, that finger is not available. <laughs> and so the traditional way of having an alternate was to do what's called a fork. It's called a fourth F. And I think that that idea goes clear back to recorders, although I don't know that much about, our, about recorders. Well, at any rate, uh, in the last 60 years, apparently, uh, oboe manufacturers have figured out a way that you can play the, an alternate F using the other hand. And then you don't have this problem with, with that finger on the right hand. However, I've found, especially to do it in front of an audience, uh, I'm not ready. <laughs> I'm still using four deaths today because to play in front of an audience, you've got to be comfortable enough with it. And to be comfortable enough with it, uh, you're relying an awful lot on finger memory and other memories. And, you know, I'm just going to have to go do enough exercises where I learn the new F and eventually it becomes part of me. Because um, it's, when you're playing 16th notes in an allegro, you don't have time to think. <laughs> I mean, you've got to feel comfortable with it. Is the instrument that you have the maximum number of keys available or stops? I would assume so, although I don't really know the answer to that. I didn't know if there was another level. But it, it seems to play better. Uh, basically, uh, well, we were talking, the lowest notes on oboes just goes just below the middle C, right? Whether it's a B or a B flat. And if you start at middle C, you have a certain kind of fingering above middle C up to the next C. And then with you know, the same fingering pretty much the next octave, but there's various ways of making it an octave. You know, octave well then, it's, a diff it's kind of an adventure when you go in the third octave. From what I've read about my first oboe teacher, he was apparently played that octave with, up in that region with ease. I got up to a D today a couple times, which is the beginning of that third octave. Um, but I think pretty much, uh, yeah, this, this has about as much as an oval is going to have. Okay, other questions or comments? If, aha, uh -huh. one over here. Uh, oh, Frank Fermi. You're too close. <laughs> I was just wondering whether the composers who played, played these oboe. Two of them. Telemann was an oboe player. Handel was an oboe player. Uh, and they actually got together when um, Telemann was 23 and Handel was 19. Uh, they, were, they were about 25 miles apart. They made it a point to get together and they wrote to each other. Uh, interestingly, well, none of the others, as far as I know, played the oboe of the eight we're doing in this series. Um, Telemann, you know, you wonder how much do these people know each other? Uh, you know, I had the thought with Marcello, who was born in Venice, died in Brescia. You know, well, 
who else was born in Venice? Vivaldi. And they were eight years apart. Did they know each other? It's conceivable. Uh, but Telemann not only knew Handel, but later in life became a, such a good friend of Bach that he is a, a, a godfather to Bach's oldest living son. Or the oldest one who lived into adulthood. Um, Bach never met Handel, however, even though they were... They lived at the same time. They were in Germany, but they weren't close together at the right time. <laughs> so on. Okay, any other questions or comments? If not, it's been fun playing for you, and uh, we'll hope to repeat it in four weeks with, uh, who did I say, Haydn and uh, Chimorosa. And maybe with uh, granddaughter Julia. Julia doesn't know this yet, so. We'll see if we can push her on. Okay. Thank you, Lou. Thank you.